<clears throat> Welcome to the San Gorgonio Chapter Trail Talk series. My name is John St. Clair, and I will be your Zoom host tonight. And our program tonight is touring uh, Yellowstone National Park and Grand Tetons National Park. Uh, okay. by um, Julianne Anderson. You can put this up there. Before we get started, I want to um, talk about the ground rules. We want everybody to be muted, um, except for the speaker at the time. And uh, if you have questions for Julianne, what we want you to do is we want you to write it in the chat section. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little talking bubble icon with the word chat under it. If you click on it, it opens up a box off to the side and you uh, can send the message to everyone. Just click in there and type in your message and uh, I'll be monitoring that and I can relay questions to Julianne uh if there's a convenient place for her to stop or certainly at the end of her talk uh there'll be plenty of time for questions but if you write it down in the chat you won't you won't forget your question so that's how we uh do that and i want to um let you know that next month's topic is uh being presented by moises cisneros who's a uh, um, sierra club staff person and he's going to talk about the campaign to get um, a Chuckawalla National Monument declared and uh, what they're doing with that and what that area is like and why um, it would be good to have that made into a national monument. So that's next month and um, let's see what else. Oh, you know, we started trail talk because there were no hikes uh, during, you know, the beginning of COVID. We are doing outings now and there's lots of hikes. So be sure to take a look at the chapter website and outings. Same place that you register for this trail talk series is where you register for hikes. And we're, we're winding down the really uh, difficult hikes that are done during the summer when we want to be up at high elevation because it's too darn hot to hike at lower elevations. And as the weather cools down, um, and particularly after it snows, the hikes will be at lower elevations. They won't be as strenuous, but nonetheless, still beautiful and fun. So be sure to check out the uh, outings section of the chapter. And this session, as all uh, trail talk sessions is being recorded and probably tonight uh, if not tonight tomorrow morning I will post the video on the San Gorgonio chapter YouTube channel so if you uh, are not able to watch the whole thing tonight or you want to share with someone else that you think might want to watch it um, the reminder message you got from me today had the link to the uh, YouTube channel, and then you can watch the session or, or pass sessions for that matter at your leisure. So at this point, um, I want to uh, introduce our speaker, Julianne Anderson. Julianne is one of the three members of the Trail Talk Committee and um, puts in a lot of effort rounding up speakers and sometimes speaks herself as she will tonight. She's also an outings leader and um, longtime Sierra Club member. So I'm going to remove the spotlight off of me and put the spotlight on Julianne and she can take it away. Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone here and uh, looking forward to talking a little bit about um, uh, my spouse Maggie's and, and my recent road trip through or, or part of our recent road trip was through Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks this May and June. Um, so let me share a screen and we can get started. Oh and
There we go. All righty. Here we are. Um, I want to take a about half an hour, 40 minutes, I think, in this feral talk, just to go through um, what was a wonderful road trip this year through Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. Um, uh, we started in Yellowstone in um, May, and then we um, proceeded up to the uh, Canadian Rockies and then over uh, across the Trans-Canada Highway and down to the upper Midwest to see family. And then we came back to the Grand Tetons about a month later in June. So uh, it was nice to see Yellowstone while it was still very snowy. It was just thawing out. And then by the time we came back to Grand Teton, it was just an explosion of wildflowers. It was spectacular this year. Um, we traveled with our dog, Mac. Uh, so we didn't camp. We we weren't camping this year because we were road tripping and hoteling. Um, then we stayed in the national park lodges, which were wonderful and pet friendly. Unlike Yosemite or California, or some California parks. Um, now Sequoia does take dogs, but uh, Yosemite does not. Yellowstone and Grand Teton both do. If you want lodging. Uh, at least in, uh, we were at Canyon, uh, the Canyon Lodge, and then in, in Yellowstone and the Jackson Lake Lodge in, Grand, in uh, Grand Teton. So we had a wonderful time with our dog. Limits with that are we, we didn't do a lot of, of hiking because in national parks in, in the United States, you cannot hike on park trails. You can, you can hike with your dog in the national forest. Now up in Canada, um, th th their national parks allow dogs on the trails but not in the United States. So we uh, did a lot of auto touring, wa walked kind of locally, but toured the, the national parks in that way. And that's what I'm gonna be showing you tonight. Okay, so there's Maggie and Mac, and there's uh, Mount Moran in the background, Jackson Lake uh, in, in June. And then on the right, that is the, the beautiful Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone, um, steaming and gorgeous. And there we have the uh, the Roosevelt Arch, built in about 1903 and dedicated by Theodore Roosevelt in the northern part of the of Yellowstone. And on the right we have the the full Teton Range, Mount Moran, in the center. This is looking from around the Snake River and the Oxbow Bend, uh, and then uh, the the Tetons here to the left. And we're looking west because the the Tetons are in an eastern uh, range of the, uh, the eastern face of the Rockies. And we're looking over the meadows and wetlands of the, the Snake River area. There's the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, uh, looking gorgeous uh, at Inspiration Point in, in Yellowstone, just stunning. That was one of our photos. And this is uh, uh, Old Faithful, as many of you will recognize, steaming, not erupting, but steaming. And at that area, as you, you many of you probably know, is very fully developed with broad rock walkways. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a lovely open area to see that, that upper geyser basin there in Yellowstone. So now I wanted to give you some background to kind of whet your appetite. Um, before I give you my impressions of our, our trip. So we wanted to go through um, some natural history, some human history, geology, geography, and, and whatnot. Um, as many of you know, uh, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons are part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And what that means is it's the, the plateau that encompasses both Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton. You can see here on the map, um, it's, it's this Yellowstone plateau that they've marked out here. In the diagram, we're looking, um, looks like we're looking east. Uh, this is across Yellowstone Lake. This is, um, looking down toward, uh, um, out toward the east coast, um, looking, uh, at the, uh, 
at Soroka Range here across Yellowstone Lake. So Hayden Valley here in the center of the park, uh, Old Faith will be here. And this is this is really the that plateau that encompasses the whole ecosystem where animals range back and forth. Um, so it's not just it's not it's not encompassed by park boundaries. Although over the years they've tried to enlarge the parks to protect as much as possible. It's really the plateau itself. There are numerous national forests that surround the two parks um, in uh, Montana to the north and Wyoming to the south. So just bear in mind, this is a, a large ecosystem where these all the wildlife and the, and the flora um, uh, survive. So some fast facts. Uh, the Teton Fault, which is that 40-mile fault that, that encompasses the, the Grand Teton Range, a short fault, a young fault, a young range, it started to rise about 13 million years ago. Um, so this range, is, as mountains go, it's relatively young, um, and it's, it's a fault right at the base of the mountains that started, you know, rising in, 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 at that time. The Yellowstone Caldera which is the giant what, super volcano underneath Yellowstone, which causes all of these thermal features that we're going to talk about. That erupted 600,000 years ago. And the caldera encompasses, it's like a giant crater that encompasses practically all of Yellowstone National Park. Um, and you, I remember driving in one night from the Tetons and you can feel it. You drop, 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 drop into Yellowstone. And that's from the edge of the, of the caldera. Native American inhabitation of greater Yellowstone started at about 9,000 BC. So, so Native Americans have been in the park, uh, roughly 2000 or 11,000 years, um, in the area that the 26 tribes that are affiliated with Yellowstone and the 24 tribes that are affiliated with Grand Teton. Yellowstone became uh, our country's first national park in 1872, just seven years after the Civil War. President Grant signed the legislation. Grand Teton uh, was later, 50 years later or so. Um, and in fact, the first conversations uh, at Maud Noble's cabin in Moose, in the center of what is now the park, happened 100 years ago in 1923. That's the year my dad was born. Um, and that's when they first had the conversations about the park. And then uh, they brought in the Rockefellers to buy up uh, surrounding land. And the park idea was off and running for Grand Teton. But quite a few years later, Grand Teton and these areas were very remote back in the day. So uh, important that uh, we understand how hard it was to, to get to them. And that's why it took a while uh, to be explored by uh, European Americans and, and to be, um, be seen and, and protected. Some natural history. Uh, here we have the, the Grand Teton itself here uh, with beautiful fall foliage here on the left. Elk, uh, the elk herd in Grand Teton is one of the largest in the country. Um, although we should know here in California, our tule elk are practically as big. We saved them, and they've been dispersed throughout the state of California. But I think the, the elk herd in Grand Teton is still larger. And here we have the classic bison with a, a steaming spring here in, in the Yellowstone. Some natural history um, regarding the thermal features of Yellowstone that you might want to refresh your memory about. Here, the diagram on the left shows the four different kinds of thermal features. We have geysers, we have hot springs. Um, so the geysers boil and erupt periodically. Some are regularized, some are not, uh, based on the hot magma below. Hot springs um, are just constantly hot pools of water. Fumaroles are basically vents and they steam. I remember the first time I went to Yellowstone, I thought the place was incredibly freakish because you go along and there'll be a beautiful meadow and there'll be like this tendril of steam coming up. Just a freakish thing. And then we have also have the fourth thing, which is mud pots. So those are the four types of, of thermal features. Um, 
then we have um, kind of a listing of some of the geysers here with Old Faithful down here in the bottom right. Our geography, um, we have just wanted to get you oriented, Northwest Wyoming and the Northern Rockies. So here we have, you can see my, my cursor here. This is the Wyoming border. So this is Wyoming. Most of most of the, the parks, all, all of Grand Teton and most of Yellowstone are in Wyoming. There's a little sliver here in um, or, uh, Montana, just around the Bozeman area here. And there's a bit, Montana comes down, so West Yellowstone. And then I believe a little tiny bit is also in Idaho. Uh, but this is the orientation. The mountains come down here. We have the Wind River Range here. So if you're approaching from the east, from Casper and parts east, you're going to be going through those mountains to approach Grand Teton from the east or Yellowstone from uh, Cody, from that from the eastern part. Um, we also have mountains here up in the Bozeman area in, in uh, Montana. Um, and of course, the mountains down below here leading up to the Tetons, the, the, the Rockies proceed right up. Um, and here down here is the Utah area in Salt Lake just to get oriented. Um, here's the geography. We have a, a, a map of Yellowstone. Uh, just to show you, here's the classic figure eight, the roads that were built starting in the uh, 1880s, the figure eight road here in Yellowstone National Park. Um, park is here, Grand Teton is directly south. Here we have Yellowstone Lake in the, um, the south, east part of the park. Yellowstone River comes down here through the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and drains into the lake. Whoop, hold on. Um, upper uh, northeast corner is Lamar Valley where the, the wolves are. The northwest corner is where uh, Mammoth Hot Springs and that's where the U.S. Army started its stewardship before the National Park Service. So there's Fort Yellowstone is here and there was a series of army camps here to, to help them um, uh, steward the park. Uh, the Norris area, where you, the beginning of the geyser basins, uh, the Madison River, this is where the Nez Perce fled in 1877 through the park, and they almost made it to the Canadian border. They were fleeing out of Oregon. Um, then we have uh, the middle geyser basin, where the Grand Prismatic Spring is, and the upper geyser basin, where Old Faithful is. And then the road down here through down to the, the John D. Rockefeller Parkway and into uh, Grand Teton South. So that's just kind of an orientation of Yellowstone. The Tetons, a much smaller park. Um, here's where the original park, the mountains and the Tetons themselves, that was the original park in 1929. We'll discuss later on uh, the surreptitious land purchase, which Horace Albright, who was the superintendent of Yellowstone convinced the Rockefellers to do. So kind of like, although this is a much happier story, kind of like Mulholland went and secretly bought up the Owens Valley, you know, under, you know, had people go out there and do this. Well, Rockefeller kind of did the same thing. Had the shell company, so people didn't know it was him. and They didn't jack up the price, but he bought up all, all this land in, in the sage flats uh, below the mountains to protect them from commercialization and overdevelopment. And uh, that was uh, made a national monument by FDR in the middle of World War II, 1943. And then that was uh, merged into the National Park by Harry Truman in 1950. The northern part, the John D. Rockefeller Parkway was added in the 70s under Nixon, I think it was 72. And then I think very recently was the Lawrence Rockefeller Elk Preserve down here in the Southwest. So. Grand Teton has very much been pieced together over the years, and, and we'll talk more about that, but very interesting conservation story starting in the 20s. All right, geology. A caldera and a sheer uplift. Well, as we mentioned before, the caldera, the, the super volcano of Yellowstone encompasses the center of the park here. So we see this, this uh, lot this overlay is the caldera half of the lake yellowstone it goes down here where old faithful is up on the the west to where the geyser basins are grand prismatic and the, the norris and then up through kind of the 
the Hayden Valley and, and uh, the Canyon area. Uh, it does not go up here to uh, as much uh, to the Mammoth Hot Springs or the Lamar Valley. So the main caldera here is the center of the park. And that's where the super volcano erupted 600,000 years ago. In the Tetons, we have the Teton Fault here, which is a short 40 mile fault. And this is what started uplifting uh, uh, 30 million years ago. Um, and uh, uh, the sheer new set of mountains that, that we see, this, this eastern uplift, which is very much like our Sierra Nevada, our eastern Sierras. It's that same, it's not the gradual basis that's kind of in the western side as you come in from Idaho Falls or, or from the 15, which is over Interstate 15. It's, that's very much it, like the western side of our Sierra, our gradual slopes. <coughs> the eastern slope of the Rockies here, the Tetons, are very sheer. And it's the same as our Eastern Sierra. Same, kind of like a giant came and pulled up that, that slab of granite just, sh just sheerly so that it's not smooth. It's not uh, a gradual. Here's some more geology about the magma chamber underneath uh, Yellowstone. Here, this is looking kind of south. We see the, the caldera, these are the Tetons here south. We see um, Shoshone Lake, you know, so over here in the, this is like the John D. Rockefeller Park way down in the Tetons, and it comes back Lewis Lake and Shoshone, and here's Yellowstone. But so you see the, the caldera boundary, and there's this gigantic magma chamber, which still exists, of course. It's what's heating everything. It's, the, it's like sterno or, you know, this, this huge heat that is heating up all of these, um, geysers here's old faithful and here the here's here's the other geyser basins here so uh very interesting to see how this all works all right and here's yet another just to help us understand forest rock layer water is being heated by that magma we have the periodic heating of and the kind of explosion of the geysers then we have the hot springs the fumaroles and the mud pots here in, in uh, our, our various thermal features in Yellowstone. Okay, wildlife. A lot of people call this area the Great North American Serengeti. It's where we have some of the largest numbers of our, is, is what John Mary used to call quadrupeds, you know, undulates. Um, things like bison, we have a huge herd there. Uh, elk, as I mentioned, some one of the largest herds. We have uh, beautiful moose, we, we have pronghorn, deer, um, just all sorts of large North American mammals, grizzlies, black bears, uh, wolves uh, in, in the northeast corner, coyotes. I mean, just huge number of these large North American mammals. And here's some grizzlies, you can see your little humps. Here's a very kind of cold and dampish looking gray wolf in snow. Uh, elk bellowing. We have a grouse here. The beautiful trumpeter swans, which you'll see a lot of them in the, the wetlands of the Tetons uh, near the, the Oxbow and, and the Snake River area. Just beautiful birds. Very fierce looking little pika and a mountain lion. Uh, they range through uh, the, the greater ecosystem as well. And here's just sort of a nice collection of all the wildlife. We have uh, uh, bison with calf, pronghorn, black bear, grizzly with cub, gray wolf, bighorn, uh, deer, elk, coyote, uh, hawk. And then we have pelicans, mallards, and uh, the, the trumpeter swan. So just kind of a nice collection. Plus our marmots and our, our uh, prairie dogs out in the sage areas. Speaking of, floral areas in the parks, um, generally alpine, uh, forest areas, meadow, sage flats, and wetland. Um, on the left, we have a typical Yellowstone woodland, lodgepole pine, grizzly bear. Uh, we've got pronghorn and deer, some crow and raven, uh, healthy uh, forested area. 
we got sagebrush here, which are in the sage flats, particularly in um, the Tetons. Uh, <clears throat> there's a beautiful autumn scene of Mount Moran and the Tetons to uh, the, the left, the south. And this is sort of a wetland area uh, in, the, in the Coulter Bay, Jackson Lake, uh, Snake River area there. Wildflowers, which were in their profusion this June because they had a lot of water. And here's some more wetland and cattail uh, to the right. Other flora, this was a big lupin year. I didn't see quite as much paintbrush uh, as we drove through, but incredible lupin. Inc you know what John Muir used to call, you know, the incredible mountain garden. Um, that's what it felt like, just stunning uh, this year. And here we are in a meadow area. Uh, this is um, kind of in the area where we were staying at the Jackson Lake Lodge, looking out in, in a little drier than the wetland at the plain um, that's, that's below Mount Moran. We have a moose and lilies. They, they love being out in the water with those long legs, uh, looking for all the, the plants that they enjoy. Okay, some human history. As I mentioned before, uh, Native Americans started ranging into the area and inhabiting the area about 9,000 year, uh, 9, BC, uh, so about 11,000 years ago. Um, and as I mentioned, there are 26 tribes affiliated uh, with Yellowstone, 24 with Grand Teton, ranging from the Minnesota border all the way over to Oregon and Washington. So people have been ranging through this area for thousands of years. And inhabiting it. Once the Europeans came in, a lot of hell and havoc. Um, as, as all of us are aware, the bison slaughtered incredibly quickly after the Civil War. Um, some expeditions came in the area and, and, and people were flooding into the area, uh, overland wagon trains, and then the railroads came in after the, the Transcontinental uh, Railroad ran in 1869. Uh, Northern Pacific came in in the 1870s and 1880s into the upper Rockies. Uh, by the 1880s, there were barely any. I mean, they, Teddy Roosevelt had a, you know, how he's his great conservationist, but also a sportsman, quote unquote, rushed as a young man in 1883 out to the Dakotas because he was afraid he wouldn't be able to shoot his bison, his buffalo. By 1900, there were 25 bison left in, in Yellowstone. So the slaughter was almost complete. Um, first cars came in with Model T and, and other, uh, these are larger, it looks like, looks like here, in 1915. And by the 50s, we have the post-war baby boom years uh, where the mid-century modern architecture of Mission 66, the movement to um, revive and, and, and uh, expand the infrastructure in the parks uh, was in full swing. So this is the beautiful um, mid-century modern canyon lodge area full of 1950s station wagons. So here, the Native American presence, as I mentioned, um, here we have a map showing from, uh, from here at the uh, Minnesota border. And we have in Northern North Dakota, the turtle band of the Chippewa, the Ojibwe, uh, all the way over into Oregon and Washington. Here's ancestral lands of the Nez Perce and Maker Se. And they fled the U.S. Army. They were resisting being placed on reservations. So in 1877, they fled through Yellowstone right along the Madison River. Almost made it to the Canadian border, but didn't quite. All these other tribes, um, Blackfoot to the north here, uh, Crow to the northeast, Shoshone on the east, Gros Ventre, Gros Ventre, the south, uh, Bannock, uh, Nez Perce. Um, so all these different tribes ranging through here, uh, using the resources and depending on the season, up in the high country in summer, and then uh, in the flats uh, in the colder months. And you see traditional dress, ceremonial dress, uh, traditional footwear um, from the 19th century. Uh, early U.S. exploration. Um, all of us are aware of Lewis and Clark going through around, around 1805. John Coulter was part of Lewis and Clark, of that expedition, um, of the, the Corps of Discovery. 
Um, he, two years later, uh, came through in the winter in the Greater Yellowstone. So they named Coulter Bay after him. Um, and uh, he also, I believe, along with other, other trappers and explorers, named um, Jackson Hole. As you know, the town in the area is Jackson, but trappers used to call valleys holes. So this was Jackson Valley or Jackson Hole. Um, but it was named by Coulter and other trappers. So fast forward from Coulter's uh, exploration or journey in there, uh, various trappers between 1807 and the Civil and the Civil War, um, and then after the Civil War, an explosion of interest. Um, a private uh, uh, expedition, the Folsom Cook Peterson expedition, then the Washburn Langford Doan in 1870, where the Northern Pacific Railroad started to take interest and was financing it. This is all out of Bozeman. And then the big, the Hayden expedition uh, for which uh, the Hayden Valley in Yellowstone is named. And this is where photographer William Henry Jackson, we can see down here below photographers of the 1870s and Thomas Moran. And here's Moran's rendition of the uh, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and Yellowstone Falls here. They came and with their photography and artistry, the rest of the country started to understand what was what they had here, that this was a, in, an incredible, incredible landscape uh, in Yellowstone and later in Grand Teton. So some early US history in Yellowstone, we have uh, you know, seven years after the Civil War, uh, President Grant signs the Yellowstone National Park Act. Um, five years after that, the Nez Perce are fleeing uh, west to east through Yellowstone and, and, and going out toward the Canadian border, uh, chased by the cavalry. Um, tragic. Uh, 1882 uh, is when the U.S. Army started to come in, and they uh, uh, set up at, at Mammoth Hot Springs in the upper northwest of the park, and they were there until the Park Service took, took hold. Uh, it was, the Park Service was started, as you know, in 1916 and, and took over uh, stewardship in 1918 at Yellowstone. Uh, Northern Pacific Railroad uh, started uh, uh, in 1883, arriving in, in Montana nearby. Uh, and that same year, uh, Congress uh, voted money to build the figure eight road that we know today, the Grand Loop, it, for, which was a carriage road at that time uh, in Yellowstone. By 1902, only 25 bison remained. And so conservation efforts were started at that time, after the great slaughter of all the millions of, of bison in uh, the, the Mountain West. 1903, Theodore Roosevelt, President Roosevelt dedicated this. This is the North Entrance Arch with the carriage at the time of Roosevelt's dedication. And this is from a postcard of the, of the day. 1915, uh, the first car, which was a Model T, was allowed into Yellowstone. Grand Teton going south. Uh, fast forward about 50 years. This is the interior of Maud Noble's cabin. And she and local community members in the Moose area um, uh, of what is now the park recognized that this incredible landscape was going to be destroyed with pell-mell development. So they invited uh, uh, Horace Albright who was, as, you, as some of you may know, is Stephen Mather's uh, uh, sidekick uh, when the National Park Service was started in 1916. And when Mather's health took its toll, Albright basically, you know, was superintendent of Yellowstone and took over the park service. He met with Maud Noble and community members here at her cabin, her beautiful little cabin here near Meaner's uh, Ferry in the Moose area where the, the main visitor center is now and the Moose enters to the park. And they started discussing a national park. So this is 100 years ago this year. Um, they realized that they would have to buy property and that they didn't have the money. So uh, Horace Albright had the bright idea of <clears throat> three years later meeting with John D. Rockefeller <clears throat> Jr. and touring down uh, into Grand Teton. And while they were watching Moose, uh, Horace Albright started talking about buying property. <laughs> so uh, later Rockefeller asked for maps and agreed. And 
Albright was thrilled because he had a financier to buy this land. And Rockefeller started setting up shell corporations and uh, surreptitiously buying up the land. By 1929, President Hoover uh, signed the Grand Teton National Park Act right before the Great Crash. Uh, so the, the the initial park was just the mountains. It wasn't the sand, the salt or the um, sage flats uh, uh, spreading out before them. That's the land where Rockefeller was purchasing. And by 1943, Rockefeller sent a hot letter off to FDR saying, hey, I've got this land. Do you want it or not? Because if you don't, I'm going to sell it. And Roosevelt and Albright, who were, of course, Albright was still in charge, scrambled and created the National Monument in the middle of World War II. And then uh, about seven years later, Harry Truman consolidated got Congress to consolidate everything into the National Park. Uh, and that's the same year that Mission uh, Mission 66 was launched to modernize the infrastructure. After all the baby boomers started flooding into the parks after World War II, uh, families with baby boom families. Okay, how did Tori Yellowstone? Uh, just kind of a, I have some approaches that you might use when you're going through both Yellowstone and the Grand, Grand Teton National Parks. Um, Yellowstone is the classic grand loop in the figure eight method. So uh, we have the eight big sites in the park here, starting with Mammoth Hot Springs in the Northwest, coming down to Norris and, and that, that geyser basin and down to the middle geyser basin, which is Grand Prismatic Spring. Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin, then down to West Thumb. Uh, you can see the lake. This is Yellowstone Lake. It looks like a thumb. Then Yellowstone Lake itself with its grand old lodge there. Then up to Canyon where Maggie and I stayed, which was absolutely gorgeous um, and has been newly, um, had new additions to the, the, the uh, accommodations there, which are lovely. And then out to Lamar Valley where the wolves are. And here, the Hayden Valley is here in the middle where there are just an abundance of bison and other large animals. So the, the way you might approach this is taking, you know, one leg or part of this at a time, if you have enough time, or just kind of do one loop in one day and one loop in another, or pick out, you know, certain ones that you like. But that's the traditional way is to, to kind of cover parts, portions, or an upper Part of the figure eight and then the lower part so depending on how much time you have and here these are the eight parts of the of the uh the grand loop um, that we just discussed mammoth hot springs norris etc over to uh old faithful and ending the, the lamar valley for the wolf sightings our impressions and these are our photographs um, we had a spectacular time. This is, as you can see, there's a lot of snow still around. This is mid-May. Um, Maggie teaches and she finished up her semester. So we took off on the road trip. Um, and so this is um, the Hayden Valley leading up to Canyon. We, we, we drove through in the late afternoon, early evening and lots of wildlife. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, this was our, our pet friendly cottage. These are the old cabins that were um, part of um, the original Mission 66 and have been renovated. They're all pet friendly. They're absolutely lovely, not too expensive, you know, brand new restrooms, very comfortable. Um, we, we loved it and everything walkable. We walked here. They're brand new or newish. Um, large buildings uh, that have been added, uh, I, I think starting in the Clinton administration, they funded this. Um, so hotel style rooms in the area, and there's several of these buildings, you can walk all through them. And then they've kept the um, mid-century modern, or as they say, the NPS modern um, uh, cafeteria area and uh, that, that more toward the center. So and this is just the, the ponding behind our room, which just shows how the tremendous snowfall and how wet it was this, this um, May. This talks about Mission 66 and what a huge thing this was for the park system. Um, after living through the depression and the war, um, a lot, the, the parks were neglected because of the war effort, understandably. But once people came back from the war, um, 
started families and started seeing the parks and road tripping became a thing, um, the parks just got slammed with um, visitors and overrun with visitors. And the infrastructure was old and, and not um, uh, not up to what, what it was facing in terms of visitors. So this Mission 66 was started, 66 referring to the 50th anniversary, 1966 of the Park Service. So they wanted on this 50th anniversary to have this massive um, modernization. And they, they, they changed architecture from the, the craftsman style, um, kind of old faithful in Awani style of um, architecture to this sleeker mid-century modern style, which was just very interesting and beautiful. I mean, if you ever seen the movie North by Northwest, it dominates the movie on that, that, that mid-century modern uh, style that you see at Mount Rushmore and other places and it, that really started <clears throat> here in Yellowstone and Grand Teton in Mission 66. Um, more highlights of our visit. Uh, this is the, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone <clears throat> in that center part of the park, the Yellowstone River that flows into Lake Yellowstone, the Yellowstone Lake. The spectacular falls of the, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, just gorgeous. And uh, I think this is from Inspiration Point, are a bit crowded, but you just forget about it all because there's this lovely, lovely falls um, and, and the flow and the color of, of this canyon. Um, so just spectacular and very close to that canyon area of the park. Um, crossing over the figure eight over to the west side of the park by Norris, uh, the Norris Geyser Basin. This is what I mean about this sort of freakish, um, it's just stunning. You, you see this geyser basin where these fumaroles um, of steam and hot springs, and it, 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 it looks like this just boiling flat, um, I wouldn't say a hellscape, but it's just, it's, it's just very, very different um, and fascinating. Uh, and then nearby we have these um, meadows with all these large uh, mammals. These are bison just grazing and every once in a while there'll be like a little fumarole of steam coming up. Um, but just a spectacular geyser basin here with these bits of steam. Um, here's the middle geyser basin where the, grand, the spectacular Grand Prismatic uh, hot spring is, the spring. It's, it's known for this deep blue color and then all the bacteria around the edge of it gives, gives it these yellows and oranges. Um, here's our photograph of it, steaming as a hot spring will, and then all the color along the edge. Uh, the Old Faithful area, um, you the, this broad walkway leading up to probably what is the most iconic symbol of Yellowstone, along with the bison is Old Faithful Geyser. And here it's just steaming, but just a lovely area. Although you can see, I think, fire damage from the 1988 fire, which ravaged um, a significant portion of Yellowstone. So up here, on the, this is the edge of the caldera, the slope of the caldera. And I remember I was mentioning coming up from uh, Grand Teton and you drop down <laughs> into Yellowstone along down the highway comes down to this wall of the caldera here but this was fire damage from 1988 and subsequent fires. Anyway, more of this old faithful area. This is where the first great lodges were built. Uh, this is the old faithful inn started in 1903, kind of that Teddy Roosevelt era, um, same era as El Tovar and Grand Canyon, kind of these grand old lodges about 20 years before the Iwani in y Yosemite. But this is the kind of the granddaddy of them all. Uh, the Old Faithful Inn, and here, here it is today. Uh, this is at dusk, and I just wanted to get a shot of this beautiful kind of craftsman style, <clears throat> almost a craftsman slash alpine style with the antlers here over the, the doorway, just really striking. And you step in there, and there is about five stories of open space inside this beautiful um, lobby with huge beams. Um, just spectacular. Mammoth Hot Springs, uh, Fort Yellowstone and the Roosevelt Arch. 
here are the hot springs in the upper northwest, um, these gorgeous colors uh, coming down through these mineral deposits of the hot springs. Again, more fire damage above here from the various fires that have been Yellowstone over the last 25, 30 years. Um, Fort Yellowstone started there, as we mentioned, when Phil Sheridan of Civil War fame came in the 1880s, saw what a disaster Yellowstone was because of vandalism. It wasn't being it wasn't being stewarded, regulated at all. People were just coming in there because Congress, of course, hadn't really appropriated much money. Um, starting with Sheridan, he started building uh, Fort Yellowstone, which is the sandstone set of buildings, beautiful. Uh, got money appropriated for the high, the, the road, the figure eight road, the same year. And they were in there until 1918. Here's the Roosevelt Arch that I mentioned before, uh, circa, uh, this is modern, this is from our trip, but this was built right around 1903. And for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, that was the, the statement here in the, in the Great Arch. Resource materials. Before we leave Yellowstone and move on to Grand Teton, I just wanted to show you some things that, that I found very useful to orient, orient us to, to the park. Of course, the classic map that we get um, and uh, always have that handy. I like to have the National Geographic maps. They're, they're, they tend to be topos and they're very, very useful. Uh, not the kind of topo you would probably hike with because it's not close enough in, but it's a very useful map. Um, so I like to get that too, along with the park map. And then the, the official park handbook for Yellowstone, um, wonderful, it's still in print. You can still pick it up from the park. A lot of these handbooks are no longer in print, um, but this one still is, and it's, it's, it's handy. Um, your basic Lonely Planet, which I adore. These are wonderful guidebooks that give you all kinds of information. Um, history in the back, um, ge geology, geography, natural history, uh, places to stay, good itineraries. It's just, these are just an overall very handy series and I love the, the Yellowstone Grand Teton version. Very, very helpful. Also helpful um, and it, Kind of fine granular detail, this road guide, which literally as you take each portion of the figure eight in Yellowstone and in and, and, and Grand Teton as well, gives you really fine detail of what you're seeing. I really liked it. This was the, 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 the most fine detailed of all the guidebooks for a road trip through there. Um, and the, the Lonely Planet one also has good hiking, by the way. It gives you the, a, a good way to, to find the, the trails there. Uh, the, National Geographic Yellowstone, I found to be a really spectacular um, introductory summary of the park. Uh, and the photography is, is gorgeous, as you'd expect from National Geographic, even under Rupert Mur Murdoch, but the photography remains. Um, my guidebook uh, for animals and plants is always the, the Audubon Society guidebook, and the Rocky Mountain one is, is super handy. I love it. It's, it's as nice as the California one. And, and just useful. Uh, finally, the conservation guide that I liked, uh, I picked up was the, this George Black um, Empire of Shadows. And here we have the Thomas Moran artwork on it. It won an LA Times book prize a couple of years ago. It's quite a fine book about the conservation effort um, starting in the 1870s. And then this is the crazy lost. Uh, Truman Everts was with one of the explorations uh, in the late 1860s, early 1870s. This poor guy was kind of a, a greenhorn, got separated from the party, his horse spooked, he lost his glasses, he lost his knife and gun, and was wandering about, he got scalded in a geyser in a hot spring, was wandering about Yellowstone for two months, barely survived. They found him, he looked like a skeleton. So he wrote his, his this, this very... Um, detailed account of how he survived in Yellowstone. Here he is with the mountain lion stalking him. <laughs> so he was up a tree, poor guy. But that's his story. Okay, how to tour the Grand Tetons. Excuse me. Rather than the, the kind of geographic approach like Yellowstone's figure eight, this is very interesting. Um, this book is published by the Grand Teton Association. They have a number of guides, which I just love. 
They're very complete and they recommend an in a day approach. And they have all these sorts of different topics you can do in a day. So if you were there for a week, you could do seven of these. Or if you just were there for one day, you could pick one, but they have like a highlight day. You can pick the highlights of the park or a wildlife or an art day, history day, kid day, geology day. So, you know, going through the park with all these different notions in mind, um, focuses. So I, I just find that to be a very nice way of approaching the park. Um, and it, it is very doable one day because Grand Teton is, is rather small. Impressions and highlights. Um, here is the beautiful Mount Moran as seen from the back, uh, the grand uh, back area there of the Jackson Lake Lodge, looking out over the flats, the sage flats and, and meadows and wetlands toward Mount Moran. This is all in the Coulter Bay area. Um, just stunning at, at dusk, and you can see there's some there's some wildlife out here, um, some cloud at the at the peak, just gorgeous. Um, this is the spectacular Jackson Lake Lodge, uh, which I, I've always wanted to stay at. Um, and this is part of Mission 66. Um, interestingly, Gilbert Stanley Underwood was the architect of the Iwani in Yellowstone. And, you know, it's the classic um, craftsman kind of a grand lodge architecture of the parks in the 20s, in the, the teens and 20s. Garden, or Underwood... Um, pivoted at mid-century while he was still practicing architecture and built this grand mid-century modern lodge. It helped steer the park system into the, the mid-century modern NPS modern movement. Just gorgeous. The pet-friendly cottages are in the back of this grand building um, and these long, clean mid-century lines, posted beam, gorgeous. And we loved our accommodation there. It's, it was just a lovely cottage. Um, Post and being very, very 50s, but completely revamped and nice. So uh, very nice place to stay and not overly expensive. Okay, um, more impressions of the Tetons from Coulter Bay. We had the most spectacular picnic here on the shore of Jackson Lake unbelievably lush. These wildflowers were like the most incredible mountain garden. It was just a delightful picnic. We just loved it. Um, and looking out over uh, Mount Moran and here are the Tetons and then the beautiful Jackson Lake, which is full of wonderful trout. I, I fished it years and years ago when I was a kid and it was just, uh, this is just a wonderful area to be in and to spend some time. Um, and flat, you know, we're we're full of all kinds of wildflowers here. Spectacular. Jenny Lake is further south in the park. This is the the original part of the park that was protected. The the actual Grand Tetons of Sows, the three Tetons, Grand, Middle, and South, as you can see here. Um, and you can see here's Grand Teton in the classic WPA. Um this was actually the first uh, WPA print that they found. It was in uh, the bottom of a drawer. And they, years later, this is when they started finding these prints. Uh, Jenny Lake is the original visitor center. Um, it was completely overrun when we were there. We, we kind of wanted to escape. It, it, it's a very small area um, and it, it was just incredibly crowded. So not my favorite, I think Coulter Bay is by far my favorite. And then the, the Moose area with um, the, the gorgeous new visitor center and uh, Meaners Ferry, um, uh, Mod Noble cabin area, the historic area that those were my favorites. But this is the classic center of the original park, Jenny Lake. Moose, Meaners Ferry. The, the Snake River did not get crossed or, or a ferry was not built until practically the the, the 1890s and, and right around 1900 uh bill meaner and his brother opened up this uh ferry complex this kind of ranch and they built this uh ferry uh, system which they at first they were uh, ferrying wagons and then very soon after that uh cars back and forth and this is the the meaner's ferry historic district right there in, in uh 
the moose area kind of across from the visitor center is this historic district, which I found to be fascinating. Um, and here we have very right next to Meters Ferry. In fact, Maud Noble bought Meters Ferry and ran it herself is the Maud Noble cabin. And here's her cabin. There's Maggie and Mac on the porch. And there they are right near this lush, gorgeous area. But here is the, the Maud Noble cabin where that the Grand Teton National Park idea took root 100 years ago with Horace Albright and Maud Noble and community members sitting down and talking about it, about how they might have uh, a park, a national park to save this incredibly stunning landscape. And here we are, the the Maud Noble cabin, and then here are the Rockefellers. And uh, they were, this is where they were camping with Horace Albright out in the Tetons. So <laughs> he must have been a grand salesman because they, they agreed with him and started building or buying property and uh, cobbling together this uh, swath of land that later became uh, Grand Teton National Monument in 43 and then added to the park in 50. And I'll show that to you right now. Here's this uh, very wonderful placard out um, kind of outside of Moose. It shows you the progression. Here's the original park. And this area was private land in 1929. And that this is where uh, this this land here is what uh, Rockefeller started buying. Here's this is where the Tetons, part of Mount Moran and Jackson Lake, but not all of it. It's just the mountains and the foot of the mountains. Um, he, here we have 1943, where Rockefeller told FDR he better he better make a monument or else he was Rockefeller was going to sell the land. Here's the monument to the, to the right, to the east, very large and uh, immediately adjacent to the National Park. Harry Truman puts them together in 1950. And then in 1972, Richard Nixon gets the John D. Rockefeller Parkway here connecting uh, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. And then later in the 90s is the Lawrence Rockefeller Elk Reserve Preserve in the Southwest here. Okay, so here, Resource materials, I want to leave you with some of these so that when you go, you have uh, some handy resource materials to get you ready. As always, the, the classic uh, Grand Teton map that they give you, which is always handy, and the National Ge Geographic map, which is really quite an excellent map. And as I showed you before, the Lonely Planet guidebook. I, I always get these guys, put them in my hip pocket, and they're just so handy. I mean, you can get, elect you can get an electronic version as well. Um, the National Park Handbook, they still make one for Grand Teton, um, handy, and of course the road, which I, I liked a lot. And here we have um, these national, the Grand Teton uh, Association has written three wonderful, wonderful guidebooks. Um, all proceeds go to the park. Um, the best of Grand Teton, which is handy if you're road tripping through there. Uh, common wildflowers uh, endemic to the park, and then wildlife uh, endemic to the park. So these three I highly recommend. Love them. And of course, my Audubon handy field guide. Again, hip pocket or side pocket. And here's some conservation, uh, a conservation book, uh, a book or two by by uh, Robert Ryder. And he talked about the original struggle struggle for the park, um, kind of pre-war, and then the post-war. Uh, expansion of the park and, and uh, efforts to uh, continue the, the protection. So uh, the struggle for Grand Teton National Park and Peaks Politics and Passion, which is both of them very fine texts. And I'll leave you with some photos just of our trip that we had such a spectacularly wonderful time this year in May and June. Uh, there's Maggie and Mac at the Lodge, Grand Prismatic, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, Old Faithful. And then in, in June, the gorgeous Grand Tetons and Mount Moran. This wonderful mountain garden uh, in the Moose area here. Um, looking out the, the, the brand new, fabulous, uh, modern uh, visitor center in Moose. And then this gorgeous mid-century modern a uh, set of cottages behind the Jackson Lake Lodge. Just gorgeous.
wonderful place to stay. So with that, um, that was my our trip, and we uh, we we hope we're, we've inspired you to um, that Megan and I have inspired you to go and and pick up a guidebook or two and head off maybe next year. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, I have some questions. Okay. So, um, uh, I'll start with uh, Marianne as a question, were the indigenous tribes all removed from the land in 1872 when Yellowstone was declared as a national park and also the same for Grand Teton where the uh, indigenous people forced out when it was made into a park? I believe so. And I believe uh, the largest reservation near is uh, Wind River. Um, and then the, the Blackfoot North here, let me see if that, that map is helpful. See. While you're going back on that, she Marianne also asks, are these parks dark sky parks for viewing stars at night? Yellowstone, most certainly, uh, spe especially the northern part of Yellowstone. Um, Grand Teton, not around Jackson. Uh, I would think the northerly part of, of Grand Teton toward... Uh, past Coulter Bay and probably near uh, the John D. Rockefeller Parkway and Flag Ranch. Not much development there. It's probably your darkest area. The Jackson, Jackson as you know, is a ski town. It's very populated. Um, probably about the size, you know, it's it's large. It's about the size of South Lake Tahoe. Not a dark sky area. So, um, and the park is only about, you know, 60, 75 miles long, um, all told. So I, I Yellowstone is probably a better bet. Now, now going back to the tribal um, question, uh, here's the park. Wind River area is over here. Um, Rapaho Shoshone. Uh, these are all reservation lands on this associated tribe map. So, um, I think in the 1870s, all of these tribes that basically ranged through here, I, I don't know if um, they stayed. I know a lot of the, 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 the tribes, the Blackfeet and the Crow, were mainly north outside of the park. I'm uncertain if the, um, if the tribes down here in the Wind River area actually camped that flat area in the Sage Flats uh, below the mountains certainly look amenable to um, people staying there, particularly in the summer. So, um, I by the 1870s, though, I think I think all of this was being um, ranched, and uh, tribes no longer were there. So, and the 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 cavalry, we know what that means. We, we know what that means. So they went through there, um, stewarded, quote unquote, the parks. But bear in mind, they were chasing the Nez Perce through Yellowstone National Park when there were like tourists there. So talk about freakish and horrid. You had, you know, people being chased through the park by the U.S. Army to be put on a reservation, basically. So I, I think the Nez Perce may have been the last. Okay, uh, two questions from Chris Torres. Yes. In the Geyser Basin photo, was the road damage with orange cones shown caused by seismic shifts in the area? Do they have that kind of thing, earthquakes and stuff? Uh, I'm not sure about earthquakes in Yellowstone. I think in Grand Teton, yes, because of that fault line. Um, here, let's look. Most of the... Um, discussion that I've seen is thermal. I, but I mean, that's not to say that there, there aren't um, other faults that aren't shown in these particular exhibits that I chose. Uh, I, I think I, I, there may well be. Okay, another question from Chris. How many bison roam Yellowstone today? Oh my goodness. Uh, I think several thousand. Yeah. I think several thousand. I think they've had a real success going from 25 in 1902 uh, to several thousand today. Okay, so, Debbie uh, McAfee asks, what did you do with your dog when you were exploring the parks? 
he the national parks have pretty strict rules here in the U.S. Um, about dogs. So we were it, we were driving through. We would walk um, any place that's paved or has a paved uh, pathway. You can walk with dogs on leash. So um, you know, Inspiration Point, all those places, dog friendly. You cannot go on uh, trails, dirt trails. You can't bring your dogs. So this was not a hiking vacation for us. Um, when we got to the Canadian Rockies, we could, because the Canadians allow dogs in their trails. Uh, but uh, so he came with us. We stuck to, um, and there was plenty of walking to do if you, I mean, for exercise and to see things, because these parks are pretty well developed. Um, and we just, you know, you have to take care with if if there are a lot of tourists around or other dogs, and just kind of be mindful and watchful. But he came with us everywhere. Never, I I'm not one to leave dogs in the car. Uh, he always, we, we are always with him because, uh, even, even though it was cool, things can heat up, you know, and that that's bad for dogs. Right. So that's what we did. Okay. So Jeff Cooper asked from whom did Rockefeller purchase the land around Yellowstone? Actually, I think it was Grand Tetons he purchased around yes. uh, other, other than possibly farmers and ranchers. It was farmers and ranchers. Yeah. Um, there were... If, if you go into the park, there's a whole series of um, old ranch houses, the Cunningham Cabin, um, the, the Mormon Row. Uh, people were trying to, to ranch there, and it wasn't easy. It was not an easy thing. Um, and you notice it, Grand Teton was, was settled, or quote-unquote settled, kind of 50 years after Yellowstone, because it's just, it's kind of remote to get in there. Um but yeah, there were people that were ranching and there was, um, I think Maude Noble and the community members that at that time in 23, 1923, realized that a lot more people were going to be coming up and developing. The town of Jackson, I think, was starting. Um, roads were being built and they just felt like this was all going to be um, lost for the public. Uh, and it would just become a private reserve for the wealthy and for ranchers and others and miners and people that would be using it for commerce and extraction. So that's, uh, Rockefeller did what uh, Mulholland's people did. They bought the land surreptitiously from farmers and ranchers. And I don't see other questions, but I, I believe this is a comment from Marianne, genocide. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, what do you call that when you have uh, uh, people being chased in 1877 through the park? I mean, literally, if you go, you start in West Yellowstone and you drive, they, the Park Service, to its credit, has documented it w with exhibits. Um, the, ne the Nez Perce and they per se, their flight through the park from, you know, Oregon, Idaho, and they were going, trying to make it out of the park up to Canada. Um they were being chased and, and you know, sh shot at, chased. Yes. So I, I don't think there's any other way to, to, to describe that. I mean, not far from Yellowstone, if you, you go to the northwest, is where Little Bighorn was, you know, in, in the 1870s. So all this was going on at this time. You know, Custer was in Little Bighorn. And at that time, he, he he was intent on rounding people up and putting them on a reservation. And and the Crows and the Arapaho and whatnot at Little Bighorn to the the Northwest, they weren't having it. And Stupid Custer came in there with 200 guys, and here were 5,000 people camped in Little Bighorn, and they took care of business. So, yeah, all, all this time after the Civil War, what, what they used to call the Indian Wars, yeah, this is this is genocide. This is rounding people up. Not pretty. All this foment, um, you know, basically the country was turning its back on the South. The, the Civil War was done. They were looking toward the West, and they were extracting things, getting land, extracting minerals, setting up businesses, building railroads, this huge commercial activity and uh, pushing uh, Native Americans out of the way and putting them on tiny bits of land. That's what was going on. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I'm going to stop.